Greetings, ladies and mentorgens, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space, where I take stories from across the internet and read them for your entertainment. This particular story is called The FU Drive, written by Man Bear Scientist. It worked! In 30 minutes, the ALFs would come and gloss this facility, but one Dr. Paul Wilson wouldn't be here to see it. He and the other grease-stained researchers and so-called resistance fighters would be orbiting Pluto by the time the Grey Goo ate through the rusted aluminium shell they so carefully hid these past four years. But all Paul thought about was celebrating. He wished he had a cigarette, but even the toilet wine they called champagne would do. Better than to think about what happens after the jump. July 17th, 2021. First contact. Reports are coming in. An unidentified flying object has descended over New York City. We are attempting to contact NASA to confirm some details. Please stand by for more information. Here with us is... What the hell? Are we seriously taking crackpot YouTube videos and calling it news now? The 24 hours news cycle was the worst thing since baseball went on strike. Bill, uh, turn that TV off. Paul Wilson pauses in adjusting the device that looks suspiciously like a cross between a home microwave and an oscilloscope. Dials and buttons adorned the right-hand side, while the left had a screen that opened up into an empty cube with a glass plate at the bottom. The aforementioned Bill, the senior researcher in the lab, is working on a bigger version of the same machine, but his eyes are hooked on the screen. I don't know, Paul. What if it's real? Of course it isn't real. What? Is it a flying saucer? A teenager probably edited it and sent it in as a joke. They say that the image is live, though, and it isn't a saucer. It's kind of like a glowing fuzz. Uh, they say it is causing some interference with the cameras, but it looks like a glowing person. Superman or an angel? Angel. Great, just great. Maybe not a teenager, but one of those uh, religious wackos telling us the end is nigh. When did they learn how to edit a video? Regender a wrench, please. The postdoc begrudgingly hands over the wrench, probably thinking something like, I have a doctorate degree. I have deserved better than to be a glorified lab assistant. Paul doesn't particularly care. He knows that his salary is just as sad, and he's been on that side of the fence before. He whacks the side of the device before cursing it. You know, that thing doesn't have a mother, and if it did, I'm pretty sure that it couldn't do that to it. Another postdoc, one Sarah Anderson, quips from the other side of the lab. It is barely understandable. She's working with the last postdoc, Philippe Estevez, on the third and much larger version of the oscilloscope slash microwave that stands half complete, wearing respirators and standing under the fume hood after they carefully carbonylated the coating for the inside of the machine. They all gathered here for one reason, slightly above poverty wages and the chance to do something unprecedented, practical quantum physics experiments. Instead of focusing on a pair production from two protons collisions in a massive electron colliders, they were trying to do experiments to study virtual pair production on a fifth floor lab in a small city university. So far, they've mostly managed to curse the device that supposedly allowed them to adjust the rate of virtual particle production. Paul went out for his daily vice, smoking. He brought his favorite paperweight and used it to keep open the emergency exit. He suspected that he was the reason the door was adorned with a piece of paper informed office staff that it was for emergencies only, in all caps with the three exclamation marks. He liked the spot the best because of the sound, not the view. He could only see a blank concrete wall, but the bells of the college were echoed loudly between the two buildings if he went out at the right time. He looked straight up, imagining right where the so-called angel would be, before scoffing and walking back inside. Floating about a hundred feet over the skyline, a lone figure surveys the city. Its mandibles clack loudly as it processes information, a tick common to drones of this hive. Its defensive aura was set to low energy setting as the onboard computation software used its energy to expand its sensing capabilities. In a few hours, other drones would enter this airspace over most of the major cities across the planet. It did not have a name. It would not need one. Drones like it lacked personal identity. If it was asked to identify itself, it would just say something like Hive 178A. But to the public down below, it rapidly earned another moniker, Angel. 
The bipedal anthropod was characterized by two major features. The first was a pair of large, vestigial wings covered in unnecessary feathers. The second, a spherical aura that was seen as a radiant circle that from any perspective appeared to be behind the drone. The first noted aspect of the aura was an electromagnetic jamming effect that concealed the drone from most forms of photography and radar. The aura's ability to deflect most any form of projectile was not discovered until the reckoning. That aura was used for a variety of other purposes, actually controlling the drone's flight, sensing electromagnetic impulses over many miles, and controlling nanotechnological weaponry if authorized. Laced throughout the drone's biology were advanced computer systems which regulated its unique biology and controlled its defensive and offensive systems. It took only a few minutes for automating scanners systems to send a high alert message back to the hive, which the drone belonged to. Queen, Soul System humanoids have re-emerged with similar threat profile and technological proliferation. Widespread usage of prohibited tech of categories 1.3b and 1.4a has been detected. Threat to Spiral Arm 4 is rated as likely with a coincidence of four to five hundred years. The drone belonged to a species that had been granted special privileges by the Council of the Arm, allowing the use of prohibited system-level warp drives as well as specifically designed nano-weaponry. This was because it served a crucial niche while also suffering from necessary deficiencies. The first of these is a unique status that the hive-type anthropod that was incapable of sending faster-than-light messages and limited natural tools crafted through phenotypal plasticity. And sensible hives were considered to be top-level galactic threat, but the species classified as NAHTA-1L-D, 300LFT-34, evolved to control, generate, and sense electromagnetic signals and never developed ansible capabilities, allowing the Council to purge rogue sections without alerting the full species. At any given time, the species consisted of between 8 and 12 individual queens that controlled a multitude of hive ships. These made them easy to monitor and coordinate, and if need be, control. Each hive fleet was permitted into system warp capabilities through natural gates, and spent the eons patrolling up and down the Perseus arm and its spurs, looking for nascent civilizations that could threaten the order of galactic peace. In addition to ansible hives, they looked for civilizations that showed development of prohibited technologies, particularly planet civilizations that did so independently and in time scales faster than the 10,000 to 50,000 year cycles of hive fleet searches. Over the 35 million year history of the Council of the Arm, every technological possibility known to the original species that founded the Council had been ordered and put into neat little boxes. Entire tech trees of their interaction with various life forms categorized ad infinitum. Bipeds with opposing thumbs turn rapidly from rocketry to field shift antimatter propulsion that relies on non automated control systems. Whereas such a threat has never been seen from beak, mouth, or trunk based species that are more limited in manipulation. Land based organisms develop flight and interstellar flight more rapidly than sea based organisms or organisms capable of manual flight. The world computers that comprised a very specific section of the council rapidly analyzed the message from the drone and sent to respond. Hive 178A, usage of nano weaponry condoned. Species OTLBB-0.5 ID 8115 NFT-10 designated for secondary decivilization. Steps should be made to shout the species OTLBB-0.1 ID 8115 NFT-9. BTMFA 0.2 ID 8115NFT-3 MTUAB-0 ID 8115NFT-5 and TBUIW.02 ID 8115NFT-1 in hopes that one of these less dangerous species fills the ecological niche after de-civilization. Uplifting Protocols 1.5.3 and 1.5.4 condoned for previously listed species as per standards for secondary decivilization without path adjustment. Subcouncil of Intellectual Biodiversity It took approximately nine and a half hours for the drone's message to reach the high fleet, uh, 30 seconds for the Queen to receive the response from the Subcouncil after using the ship's lone faster-than-light message system. Another nine and a half hours for the Queen to send the instructions to the drones, 
before moving through the Oort cloud and settling into orbit around the planetoid known as Pluto to harvest ice and provide support for its drones. July 18, 2021. The Reckoning. Chaos. Paul Ranfrey's life. Think, what was the fire plan? Five stories, elevators aren't working. Have I ever used the stairs in this building? Steele moved. He left backwards just in time to avoid a beam crashing through the ceiling. For seconds after the crash, the blaring trumpet noise got louder. What the hell? That steel was fuzzy. And so is the hole. Feck! Directly overhead, through eight more stories of what should have been concrete, was the angel. For a second, he thought he saw the horrific insect's head on top of white robes these so-called angels supposedly wore. If I didn't know better, that thing looked at me. Looked right at me. Why didn't it point that gun thing at me? Do I not matter? Another crash, and a wave of billowing smoke hits along with more than a few embers. Waving his arms, he realized that he wasn't quite sure if he was still heading in the right way to the stairs and could only see a few steps away. And it was getting hotter. Paul! Paul, is that you? A bald man in his late fifties suddenly came through with the smoke wearing commercial grade respiratory. This was Bill Weston, Paul's one type doctoral advisor and now co worker. Put this on, quick, these fumes are from the lab. Damn, feck, crap. They are all gone, Paul, all of them. The whole lab went up in flames in an instant. Their grey crap touched the chemical cabinet. Philip, Sarah, Regendra, they all breathed it in. Goo ate the fecking fume hood. I grabbed the spare respirator on him and put it on. It was sticky. Was that? Paul! The wall zoomed in. I barely had enough time to put my hands up before I crashed. Stumbling to my feet, I turned to shout, but stopped when I saw a hole where I was standing seconds before. Bill stood on the other side saying, All right, you're all right, great. I'm going to go try go around the stairs and see the way. Don't worry about me, just keep straight. I'll go to the stairs on the other side. I'm not all right, I... But Bill was already walking away. Damn him, I'm pretty sure that he just broke a rib. <coughs> yeah, that's a rib. But sure enough, the door to the stairwell was only a hallway away. I ignored the handwritten note on the door that said, Do not open, emergencies only, and pushed on the handle. No dice. I took a couple steps back and threw myself at the door. Feck! You, Bill! Whoa. I probably should have been concerned about perforating a lung. But instead, I was looking slack jaw at my city. The city I should not have been able to see. And that city was melting. Every high-rise apartment, skyscraper, and multi-story office building looked like a candle after a decent burn. Holding my hands over my eyes, I tried to make out the clock tower of the college. Wouldn't it be over there, right past the construction, a little to the left? But nothing was left but a melted column. Drip. That's weird. There aren't any clouds overhead. Oh crap, oh feck, oh crap! I began to execute the maneuver I would call Teenage Girl Spazzes at Rodent had I a measure of poetic style. A single drop of grey liquid splattered onto the steel stairwell. Looking down, I saw the trail of eaten fabric from my collar bone to my navel, along with the debris at my feet that must have been blocking the door. I quickly realized that I should have been worried about more pressing matters. Wasn't there only a drop of the stuff before? A puddle of grey goo was forming where the drop landed, and it looked like the stairwell was just as tasty as my polo. I shrieked and began to sprint down the stairs. Splat. 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 I ran faster than I ever had in my life. My chest hurt. It seemed like it would outrun me to the bottom. Feck, how many stairs are there in five stories? Am I going to fall to death, die of a lung perforation, or get eaten alive? Splat. I'm not going to make it. I, I should jump to the ground. I probably would make it. It's only 20, 30 foot max. People can survive that. I looked down at the ground, which seemed a lot further away than 20 or 30 feet. Okay. But it would be painless. Land on my feet. It's better than being acid food. Is that an ambulance? Maybe I'm already dead. Maybe I'm in an ambulance. And I just had a heart attack. And I'm just imagining all of this. It got brighter. And louder as I turned the corner for approximately the 50th time in the stairwell. I came face to face with the angel. This close, the light from the glowing circle behind it made it almost impossible to even glance in its direction. But I shielded my eyes and dared to peek. 
Bug! Bug? Freaking bug! Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Oh, human Jesus. Am I going to be eaten? Should I have jumped? I fecking should have jumped! It pointed its weird gun thing above my head, and I prepared to get netted by the angelic bug goo and hauled away to be eaten alive. But instead, I heard a whooshing sound. Glancing upwards, with sunspots still obscuring the center of my vision, I saw the goo flow upwards and back into the building, right to where Bill was heading. By the time I looked back, the bug angel was gone. I made my way down the last few steps much more slowly. If there was any doubt about my ribs being broken, it was thoroughly dispersed by the time I got down to the last flight of stairs. Adrenaline fading, it started to dully throb somewhere between eight and oh bug Jesus on the pain scale. When I at last touched the ground, I almost fell to my knees and cried. I looked down at my watch. It had only been a couple minutes. I hate to say it, but I did cry when I felt another warm splat hit me. I'm gonna die! I'm gonna die! Bird crap? I've never been so happy about bird crap. Overhead, the offending black feathered corvid flies to its nest in the stairwell. There is a path eaten away that stops just short of the bolt holding the beam upon which the nest lies, before seeming to reverse. I remembered this later and realized that the angel life form thing was trying to save the crows. Why would it care to save crows when it destroyed the whole rest of the building? Why are crows worth saving but not Bill, not Sarah, not Philip, not Regendra, not kind-hearted receptionists or the lunch lady that gives seconds, not the countless office people with families to go back to? Over the next three weeks, I went out to the countryside. Luckily, my car didn't get any grey goo on it. I guess the angel cared mostly about buildings and left the cars parked outside mostly alone. It seems like the goo struggled to eat the roadway. I guess it's a matter of size, the amount of concrete on the road. The goo was efficient when it had a lot of surface area to eat, but much slower at eating the massive but thin concrete structures. I had to change direction a few times, but I ended up stumbling across a militia doing pretty much the same thing as me. Going town to town, trying to save any food we can, even heading to an army base to try and fight back. But I keep thinking back to my encounter with the bug angel Jesus thing. According to the militia, they controlled the goo with electromagnetic signals. The FEC, or was it the FCC, probably would have hated how they polluted the airwaves. Though I guess now that they were only things broadcasting, supposedly they hit TV, radio, internet first to cut us off. But my thought was on my research. Quantum fields, virtual particles, Randomness field dictation. To do what we wanted to do, we needed to split the signal to precisely control the randomness field of 10 billion hypothetical points. Completely different from the gray goo, but somewhat similar as well. Somehow the bug precisely controlled nanoparticles, stopping it from eating biological matter. How? At that time, I started thinking about how to capture one of them. I've seen them deflect tank shots, bombs, and even Molotov cocktails, but what about a cage? February 15th, 2025. Thank God, not bug Jesus God, for the national transportation system of China. The angelic life forms hit hard and fast. By the time the first scrambled jets reached the cities, the gray goo had already started multiplying and eating away all the vestiges of civilization. When we fired our missiles, we learned that they pretty circle around them wasn't just for holiday lights. It deflected bullets, missiles, even lasers with the same ease. I heard that we got one of them with a railgun, and the Russians managed to land a nuke before the facilities went offline. But other than that, they seemed virtually invincible. It was lights out for the human race. Literally, that is. By October, the power networks across the planet were cut. Everything from farming equipment to cell phones, eaten by the grey goo. The first year was rough. The goo didn't eat anything living, but hundreds of thousands died from infrastructure collapse. In some ways, they were the lucky ones. Millions died fighting over food and water. Me? I joined the resistance. See, we captured one of these drones. Couldn't shoot one, but we could put it in a shielded cage if we were careful. It was the crows that did it. See, these facts didn't care if humans died trying to escape the goo, but they would go head over heels for crows, and it needed to get pretty close to have that fine control it needed to do its job while avoiding the crows. Put crows in the right spot, drop a cage on the angel when it came close to protect it. Looney Tunes stuff. But if it worked, it worked. Of course, 
We tried to reason with it, talk to it, learn its language, and, uh, I hate to say it, we tried to torture it. But it didn't seem to care. In fact, inside the cage, it ceased to do anything but breathe and beat its heart. As if without external signals, it could only make sympathetic nervous responses. However, that all changed once we found the computer attached to its brain. For the record, whoever invented portable generators is a saint. Not a bug saint, but a real, certified, human-loving saint. I'd look whoever it is up on Wikipedia and make my prayers, but the ALFs took that away as well. Anyway, the law of computers says that if it exists, it can be hacked. We learned why they were decivilizing us. We learned they had done it before. I guess that is why they have an angel idea to begin with. Our ancestors must have remembered the all-powerful glowing flying beings, seared that image straight into their brains like fear of snakes and spiders. And the great-great-great-great-grandchildren remembered the image and forgot why it mattered and put them in their religions. We learned that there were different types of angel. There were the hives without wings. Hives that looked reptilian. Hives with rather esoteric shapes like wheels or with five to seven wings. All coming straight for Earth to complete the job if we didn't do something soon. Kill the parents, raise the children to be feral, restore the Earth to its natural splendor, yada yada. They were part of some grand galactic organization that controlled everything and wiped out anything it couldn't find a niche for. Or rather, wiped down. The angels do the dirty work, but they don't kill species, no. They merely decivilize them and call it a mercy that they got to them before they nuked themselves out of existence or started an intergalactic war. We also got some idea of the scriptures we broke, or more accurately, were expected to break. The technologies they knew would make, the dangers that we would pose. Nothing solid, no blueprints, and little that we'd actually done so far except build nuclear weapons and chemical rockets. We even got a little history lesson. 35 million years ago, a bunch of intelligent organisms all rose up to spacefaring status at the same time. Most of them engaged in endless war, until eventually one of them won. They decided that they were the intergalactic peacekeepers, that they had developed every possible technology and knew all the possible science, and begin bringing useful species onto the council in order to aid them in forcing their ideas on the Perseus arm. However, they were wrong. They missed something. They might know nearly every possible technology. They might be 35 million years ahead of us. They might have won the first battle for Earth. But in all their records, they don't have a single mention of hawking radiation. They may know of particle-antiparticle pairs, but they consider the whole idea useless and not at all on the list of technologies they cared about. And that was all the computer brain told us. This tech leads to this tech that leads to the end of galactic peace. I and my team, the late Bill Weston, Sarah Luke Green, Rajendra Lata, and Philip Estevez, were working on this useless technology during the start of the reckoning. Our experiment was to control the random generation of particle-antiparticle pairs in a vacuum. Maybe I should have thought. Oh, it clearly won't work. They've already tried it. But you know what I said instead. Feck that! It will work, and they won't think of it. These virtual particles are transient fluctuations that exhibit some of the properties of ordinary matter, but are limited by the uncertainty principle. The probability of such virtual particles appearing tends to be cancelled out by the destructive interference over long distances in time. They play a role in quantum tunneling. The strong nuclear force and many other classic physics phenomena were interpreted under quantum physics. Okay, okay, layman speak. Virtual particles are math aids that help us do quantum physics. We know they exist and cancel out all of the time, but on a classical physics level, they have net zero impact. They don't matter. But if one part of the particle antimatter pair spawns inside of a black hole and the other has enough velocity to escape a black hole, we get hawking radiation. Radiation from nothing comes out of something that should let nothing escape. But what if virtual particle creation wasn't random? What if the field that dictated the location and timing of virtual pair creation could be manipulated? Our enemies, the Council, in all their omniscience, never considered it. Never considered that someone could look at pure randomness and say, Eh, feck you, and grab hold of the laws of physics itself. Well, 
It took me four years testing in a secret base, wondering every day if this was the day that we heard the trumpets call again. Luckily, despite being meticulous, these things are stupid. They don't think for themselves. They just got told to hit population centers and then went on autopilot getting rid of whatever was in front of them. Did you know that there are 1.5 billion gigatons of concrete used in the US highway system? That's half of all the concrete used in the country as much as every building put together. Don't believe me? Look it up. Oh, that's right, you can't. But China was our real savior. 15 billion gigatons of concrete from 2010 to 2020. 15 billion gigatons of bug delaying aid. All to build this, the FU drive. FU to physics, FU to the bugs, FU to the so-called council. The FU drive adjusts the randomness field that dictates virtual particle creation and generating a hexagon-packed two-stage creation cycle that, in layman's speak, it makes the whole bunch of virtual pairs at once, so close that they all collapse into a micro-black hole. The second stage activates before the micro-black hole disintegrates, with antiparticle pairs facing inward. Leaving us with what? Particles, hawking radiation, matter, with more time, we could figure out how to generate near-infinite source of food, water, energy. Near-infinite, because of course, there has to be an offset. Somewhere in the universe, we create a virtual pair of dead zone each time we use this device. But there is a lot of empty space in the universe. But instead of peace, love and happiness, we spent the past four years trying to prepare for a single test to see if we could make forbidden exotic matter 0.1a matter with less energy than pure vacuum, a crucial component to holding open wormholes. And it worked. Now, if only we could figure out how to open black hole at will, and we have better than forbidden teleportation technology. Oh, that's right. We have that. There is no time for another test. We've alerted every bug in 1,000 miles of our location. In five minutes, we're going to send the drive and every man, woman, and child in the Resistance onto the Hive ship floating around Pluto, and we're going to send the Council a message. Beck, you. Paul Weston out. If I've calculated right, we still have five minutes to celebrate before liftoff. I'll do the honors by cracking the champagne. February 15th, 2025. Eight hours after the humans landed aboard Hive 178A, the Council declared unilateral surrender. It wasn't that the humans themselves could destroy the Council. They couldn't. The Council numbered three quintillion recognized individuals across the Perseus arm. Even if the human resistance could destroy a world a second, it would take ten years to wipe out the Council. And they didn't have a world-destroying bomb. They had a teleporter. But that didn't matter. What mattered is that they represented something the Council couldn't abide. Novelty. The peace of the galaxy depended on the idea that the Council was omniscient. Why bother developing tech if it would bring the boogeyman down on you, and the boogeyman developed your trump card 35 millions ago? Humanity was a type zero civilization without the thousands of benefits of the Council species, and they still managed to create something the omniscient world computers that conquered early Perseus never thought could exist. The humans merely had to threaten to bring this idea to the Council space to force concessions. Should they show up unannounced in an impossible machine, it would stir up 35 million year old sentiments of war. Many of the strongest Council members were species that originally fought the world computers for galactic dominance. If those species had humanity's FU drive, they might even be able to win a war against the Council, let alone if they discovered another new technology. High fleets could only manage so much technological development. They were equipped to stop solitary nascent Type 0 civilizations, not thousands of fully emerged Type 2 and Type 3 civilizations. The world computers made a startling concession. They would grant humanity full membership into the Council, equivalent to that offered to the originating Council races that each controlled hundreds of star systems. The only thing they asked for is humanity to remain silent about their technology, and for humanity to research new technology for the Council so that it would not be caught unawares by another new development. Humanity didn't agree. They told the Council that they would deal with the entire Council as equals, 
that they would forever have independence and sovereignty over the soul system and any unpopulated systems in a 100 light year span. If the council wished to trade, humanity would consider giving them technology after Earth is rebuilt. With all the best of council technology, of course. The world computers hummed and churned for eight hours. It was the longest deliberation ever made by the council, longer even than the peace treaties made at the start. They tried to think of every possibility, every out, every way they could control humanity or try force its hand. But in the end, it determined that it could not predict what humanity could or would do. The safest thing they could think of was maintaining peace relations. They agreed to humanity's demands. And that is the story of why the Perseus Arm has two galactic organizations. One, a 35 million year old intergalactic council composed of quintillions of individuals and millions of species. The other, a 30 year old Republic of Sol consisting of 3 billion individuals of a single species. End of story. I would just quickly like to thank the T5 peeps, Dragon Soup, Cold War Boomer Waffen, Severin Cerberus, Red Panda 121, Leslie 517, Bushmaster 177, Caspar Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Sans the Skeleton, Lightjock, Dragzoon WRE, and Lord Azrakal. Thank you very much.